Okay, okie dokie. If you have your Bibles, join with us here in Mark chapter 10 in your uh, New Testament section of your Bible. There is a plethora of sermons in here. And we're going to roll through all of them in their proper order and do the best we can to give you some grasp of these principles, parables. And so here we go, Mark chapter 10. And Jesus arose from thence and cometh into the coasts of Judea by the farther, farther side of the Jordan. And the people did resort unto him again, and as he was wont, as he wished, he taught them. He gathered them together for the teaching of the word of God. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? They want a, they want a ruling on divorce. And that's okay. It's good to have a ruling on divorce. Because there's a lot of aberrated teachings you're married, you're a man, you've woman married a wife, that's a God-ordained marriage, clean marriage. A man, one man, one woman, marriage. They become one. Now, one or the other has went and committed adultery with another person, whether it be woman or man, whatever, whatever, you know. Their thing is they have defiled the covenant of marriage. Okay? Biblically, they have the right to divorce that person. But it goes one notch further because even during this time, if a married person was found to have committed adultery in the marriage, that was a capital punishment crime. Okay? So really... The point is, that person's going to be led off to be stoned, usually, unless there was circumstances and they didn't really catch him. But if they caught him, usually one or the other was drugged before. And um, when there was adultery at hand, um, frequently they were stoned. The guilty party was stoned, and the person was free already. Okay, so, so, but sometimes there was uh, circumstances and that person did commit adultery on them or cheat on them or whatever it may be, they had the right to divorce that person. However, the Pharisees, Sadducees, that culture at that time, they started in making their own rules to who gets to divorce their spouse. I don't like him. He hates me. He, she hates me. She's not nice. Blah, blah, blah. But those were not grounds for a divorce. And so they wanted a ruling because they were hoping to catch him. But you can't catch God. God's the one that made the law of both nature, of man. And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses suffered us to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. Sometimes there was a, he, the man didn't, wasn't aware that she wasn't a virgin. And she didn't bring it up. And he discovered that and wanted a divorce. Moses said, then you can divorce her. It was one of those situations. Because uh, stoning somebody for committing an adultery only happened if you're in the covenant of marriage, if that person was single and they got involved with a prostitute or whatever, blah, blah, blah. There was a whole different set of rules for that. But if you were in the covenant of marriage, you were engaged to be married to somebody and you and into marriage and you committed adultery, that was a capital punishment crime, generally speaking. That's what Moses said. Give her a divorcement and a bill and send her away. Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. They have become one flesh. There's a lot of marriages that have been broken because they had too close a ties 
with their mother, father, so forth. And they, they're, when there's family, when there's trouble in the marriage, they're all having to swallow all the input from all these uh, well-meaning or uh, brutal talkers in the family to give them bad advice. So they are to cleave to one another and be one flesh in the name of God. And they twain shall be one flesh, so then there are no more twain but one flesh until they commit adultery. Once they commit adultery, then you have broken that oneness. You have become, a, you have become one with somebody else so that you are now tainted. You are now dirty. That person is dirty. Why would you want to stay married to them? Why would you continue to have relations with a person who has been defiled? You wouldn't. And that's when the law was given to put her away. But if there is not a, 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 an adultery in the relationship, you just don't like her anymore, then that's why Jesus said he gave you this because of your carnal minds. Because if in, in the Old Testament during the time of Moses, if there was adultery, that per other person was stoned to death. There wasn't a need for a divorcement. They were killed and they remarried somebody else. Because adultery was a capital punishment crime, and they were killed. What well, therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. So these guys are talking about little picadillo, th picadillo things, little small issues. They thought that they could bring up and divorce a woman because they saw somebody prettier, younger, or richer. I, I don't know, but they wanted a ruling. Jesus gave them a ruling. In the house, his disciples asked him again of the same matter. He said unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. So they're talking about, just like goes on here in our country, probably in yours, they, they're married, they see somebody else, they divorce them, go over to the other one. They marry, they're married for a while, they divorce them, or, or now you know people are just shacking up, living together, and making babies and moving on to the next relationship. So... After, you know, a couple of decades, you have children of various parents. But Jesus said, no, no, no. You are married to her. You wanted to marry her. Be faithful to her. Love her. Okay, keep her. So unless there's an adultery in the marriage, if you press her away from you, she's going to go commit adultery, okay? Or he's going to go commit adultery. And that it was the ruling. But if there has been adultery already, then obviously you are free. You are free to be married in Christ. If you're a Christian, you need to be marrying a Christian. If you're a Christian, you have no business marrying a non-believer. It doesn't matter the circumstance. It doesn't matter if you've been living together. You're born again. You know, you had kids together. You need to get yourself free, okay? Because the unbeliever is going to just pull you back into a life of sin. If that, you're person that you had children with, wants to convert to Christianity and wants to become a Christian and leave the, lead the Christian life, then by all means, then that's the right decision to go ahead and get married and, and move in the covenant of God's law. So Jesus gave him the ruling. Now we're shifting here to something different of who's, who's the greatest in the church. Who's, who's the greatest? I love Jesus' response. These people that bang their own drums who, who are always boasting of their works and boasting of results in their church or organization. We're just servants. We've only done that which we've been asked to do. That's all. That's all we are. It's God that receives the glory. He's the one worthy of the glory, not us. We are just sinners saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. We move on, verse 13. And they brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. Can't imagine why they did this, but they did. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me. And forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. When you become born again, you become like child in your heart, in your mind. You, you love, you love Jesus Christ. You love God. You love, you love things that God loves because you've become a child in your heart. You become born again. 
Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. When you come to Jesus Christ, it's all. It's all or nothing. You take the plunge of faith and repentance in the Son of God and never look back and push forward on the road of faith. Because we're all little kids. We're children of Jesus Christ. We are children of our Heavenly Father. And he took them up in his arms and he put his hands on them and he blessed them. That's what children need. Big hug. A little Bible story. Kiss on the forehead and get tucked into bed at night. A little love, a little encouragement, a little biblical knowledge, wisdom to sleep to. Verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? A lot of people know what they need to do. They need to give up the sin, give up their own idols, and receive Jesus Christ as Savior. They know that already. They want to they wanna ride around the barn and come in the back door. There's no back door. Jesus is the only door. Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. And that's because Jesus is God. And he can call him good because he was good. He was pure. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. And honor thy father and thy mother. Those are simple things. Don't. Don't commit adultery in your marriage. Don't commit fornication. Don't kill. Don't murder people. We're not talking in combat or in the military. We're talking out of hatred. You lie and wait for somebody and you kill them because you hate them. That's, that's murder. Not killing in combat. Do not steal. If you want something, get a job. Save your money. Pay for it. Stealing is an abomination to God. Do not bear false witness. Hmm. That's pretty common now in the news. Fake news. People are slandered. People write things on the, the space book pages and the, the Twizzer uh, outlets and, and Instabomb and Snapflap. All these places they put nasty things out there and try and bring somebody else down. False witness. It's an abomination. It's a lie. There's no gonna be no liars in heaven. So don't don't worry about it. There's no liars and hypocrites in heaven. Don't let that keep you out of church. Yep. If there's liars and hypocrites in the church you go to, that's their problem, not yours. But don't find yourself separated from Christ because of somebody else's conduct. Worry about your conduct. Defraud not. Don't try to rip people off. Then honor thy father and thy mother. Give your father and your mother their due because they deserve it. And that's God's wish. People that look to hate and lie about their parents, that's an abomination. People that strike their parents, people that cause rebellion against their parents, that's gross. And now we got the, the baseline, the foundation set for this, this man who was looking to esteem himself and have Jesus give him the blessing to come on into the kingdom of God. This man had an idol in his life. And we're going to find out what it is. Jesus always kind of waits to the end and kind of tells him a roundabout way of, here's your real problem. He answered and said unto the Lord, all these I observed from my youth. Then Jesus beholding him, loved him and said unto him, one thing you lack. That's the first four 
of the Ten Commandments. God is everything. No idols, no other gods. Honor him in everything. Respecting his name. Jesus said, one thing you lack. Go and sell whatever thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come. Take up your cross and follow me. And he was sad at the saying, and he went away grieved, for he had much possessions. He was rich. What was his idol? Wealth. His 401k plan, his bank account, his credit, his credit report. His inheritance he got from grandma and grandpa and mommy and daddy. Those were his idols, his career. Jesus said, give it all up, give it to the poor, and then you come follow me. You can't have idols in your life if you're a child of Jesus Christ. He'll rub them out of your life, and you'll have to give them up, yes. But why would you want an idol that's fake in your life? Rather, to serve the living God in a relationship that will last forever. That, my friend, is true riches in Jesus Christ. So Jesus moves on. That man decided to walk away. Jesus looked around about and said unto the disciples, How hard it is for those that have riches to enter into the kingdom of God. They don't want to give up their idol. For some people, their idol is a relationship, their fornication, living with somebody. Their relationship with prostitutes or porno or crack or cocaine or marijuana or alcoholism. They don't want to give it up. It's their little idol. The disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered them again and said to them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. How is that possible? It's not. That's why sometimes Jesus says, Hey, it's time to get yourself free on an even slate with everybody else. And they were astonished out of measure, saying amongst themselves, Who then can be saved? Jesus, looking upon them, said, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. If you see a rich man in the household of faith on fire for Jesus Christ, you know that man knows where his riches came from, and that is not his idol. His idol is Jesus Christ. And those riches are only a gift from God to be used in God's way. Because obviously that man can deal with money the way you and I probably couldn't. So we move on. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now. And this time, houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, lands, persecutions, and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last first. Man, now it's a meaty mouthful there, precious. Where you truly love Jesus Christ, and you're in the true household of faith of those that love Jesus, you will meet people from all walks of life out in the world in which you travel. And you'll meet somebody and they're in the household of faith. And all of a sudden you, there's a koinonia, a joy, and you're talking in the middle of nowhere, a store, and a coffee shop. And they're just traveling through and there was a spontaneous Holy Spirit time. That's what Jesus is talking about. Brethren from all over the world, all walks of life, in some place you've never been before, and you connect, and you share the love of Christ with one another. Brethren, that you're going to see forever. Closer than in your own family, because they love Jesus Christ. And with all of that, realize this little addition here, with persecutions. 
Don't be surprised if the people of the world or so-called Christians turn on you and hate you and start rebellions against you or, or to get you kicked out of organizations or your job or families. They hate you because you love Jesus Christ and you have the Holy Spirit in you and you're different. So realize that persecutions are part of the walk of faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said they hated me. They're going to hate you. So just, just expect it. Realize it. Many that are first shall be last and the last first. God's not a respecter of persons. It doesn't matter if you were called 4,000 years ago or today. The first shall be last and the last first. God's not a respecter of persons. It's going to be on an even keel. So they head up to Jerusalem and Jesus went before them and they were amazed as they followed and were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them about the things that are about to happen to him, saying, We go to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered into the chief, unto the chief priests and the scribes, and they shall kill him and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and scourge him and spit upon him and kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. See, the disciples were told the whole plan but they couldn't receive it. They just couldn't take it. James and John came unto him saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatever we desire. He said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant us that we may sit on the right and on thy left in thy glory. Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of? and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said unto him, We can. Jesus said, Yep, you shall indeed drink the cup that I drink of, and that is pain and death, and with the baptism that I am baptized with, you shall be baptized, the Holy Spirit baptized. The Holy Spirit baptism, as the Holy Spirit was ushered in on the day of Pentecost, that Jesus was enraptured into the Holy Spirit as he came into the womb of Mary. And the disciples weren't really at that point yet. But Jesus said, you're going to be on both ends of the spectrum, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit and persecutions and death too. Verse 40, but now Jesus gives him a little knowledge. Sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give. It is the Father's. The Father is given all superiority, even over the Son, though they are one. But there is a chain of command, and the Father has ultimate rule. It shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. End of story. Jesus gave the ruling. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. Jesus called them to him and said, Ye know not that which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles, how they exercise lordship over them, and the great ones exercise authority upon them? Yes, we do know that, but we're not quite sure why. But when you give a man a little bit of authority and power, oh, he doesn't want to give it up. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great amongst you shall be your minister or your servant. If you think you're going to enter a, a teaching ministry and have everybody praise you, you're wrong, my friend, because you now have entered the place where the persecutions are going to be coming more rapidly because you're speaking the truth. Is there a preacher there? Come on and preach the truth. Have you ever heard that song? Preach the truth, the word of God. And when you preach the truth, people hate you. And those that come to Christ, you will be their servant. Whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. 
For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus, the creator of the universe, came and washed the disciples' feet. as an act of humility and mercy. And they came to Jericho, and he went out of Jericho with the disciples and a great number of people. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many told him that he should... Be quiet, basically. Tell them to shut up. But when they told him to shut up, be quiet, be at peace, he cried even more and louder, David, thou son of David, have mercy on me. See, they, they didn't have his affliction. He did, and he knew who could heal him. The creator of the universe, the son of God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And he's going to scream even louder till he gets his attention. You want a prayer that you need offered? You get a hold of Jesus with everything you got, friend. Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise. He's calling thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Jesus just received a new disciple. Formerly was blind, but now he can see. When we come to Jesus Christ, we're dumb. We're dumb bears. We're dumb sheep. We're dumb. And we're blind. And when Jesus heals our soul and washes our sins away, we can finally see and be free and be his disciple. Because until we come to Jesus Christ, you're just blind. You're just dumb. You're just mute. But when you come to Jesus Christ honestly and say, Jesus, I'm blind. I'm a sinner. I am guilty. And that's when Jesus can reach out to you and say, come to me. And if you're willing for Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to enter into your life, then now is the time so that you will no longer be blind, but that you may see and be free. God bless you, friends. See you next time.